thank you for this uh, uh, wonderfully warm uh, introduction. It's kind of, you almost make me change my mind about what I should talk about. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the US Central Bank, uh, a lot of things, but, but I, I'm afraid I, I'm, I'm gonna stick to the, uh, uh, to the topic. Uh, and, uh, uh, and my title, which I already communicated to my voice, will the euro area survive uh, a diagnosis, not a prescription? I have to start by saying that uh, uh, it's, it's an honor to be with you uh, today, and I, I'm thankful for the invitation by uh, uh, President Hess uh, and the Wabash uh, College community to, uh, to deliver uh, the, the Rocky Memorial Lecture. Now, I have to say that you know, I did not have the opportunity to meet uh, uh, Ben Rogge. I was delighted to, uh, to meet Ben Rogge Jr. today. I have a good excuse. Uh, uh, at the time uh, 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 he passed away, I was, I was serving uh, in the National Guard of my other country, uh, you know, very close to the Middle East. So you have to forgive me that uh, I had not yet set foot in this country. So it would have been very difficult to uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to meet them, them right at, the, uh, uh, at the time. Uh, nonetheless, and even though this is only my, uh, my second day uh, here, I just uh, uh, arrived uh, uh, yesterday, um, I have learned uh, uh, about uh, the impact uh, that Roy had in, uh, uh, in this college, uh, the tremendous influence over generations, I have uh, to say is it two or three generations, depending on how you count, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Wabash uh, students who went on to lead successful lives and careers all over the country. And uh, actually, I, I, I even know people who graduated from, from Wabash. Uh, I didn't know that they had graduated from Wabash until President Hess told me about it, but I, you know, it's a, it, it may seem to be a, uh, to be a small college, but it's, it's not as small uh, as, uh, as it may appear to, uh, uh, to be. I also have to say that I, uh, uh, I have read some of uh, Ben, uh, ben Rogge's uh, uh, work. Uh, you know, I, I'm an MIT product, but uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, after I arrived uh, at, the, at the Federal Reserve, uh, I actually vastly expanded my horizons, including the Midwestern uh, tradition, <laughs> including the Austrian tradition, and that's really Ben Rogge fit, fit right in the middle of, uh, of, 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 this, of, of these traditions. I have to say that the MIT libraries are quite good, so I, I was able to get the book, uh, Proof, MIT Libraries, uh, it's, it's there. Uh, uh, so that was, that, was, that was the easy part. Uh, uh, and I, I really, reading through uh, the work, uh, um, two things I should mention. One is that I find myself uh, very much in agreement with, uh, with the basic principles uh, uh, he was teaching. And something I really appreciated through reading, uh, the wit and style. You know, it's kind of, when I read uh, uh, native writers in English, uh, these are things I think I said, boy, you know, I should learn that. Uh, but, uh, hey, you know, I'm not gonna lose my accent, I'm not gonna learn that. That's life. Uh, still, uh, here's what I've done. Um, my title shamelessly borrows from a lecture he delivered at Hillsdale College in May of 1974. This was part of the Ludwig uh, uh, of Mises lecture series. Uh, I was lucky enough, I was actually able to find it. Here's a copy of that lecture. So I have it. It's not quite the same as, uh, as the title lecture in the book, okay? Because as, as, uh, as Ben already explained uh, in the book, he edited uh, the material in the book. So the original is slightly different. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to, uh, to that, because uh, I, I, I rely on, 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 some those, on some of those differences. And let me tell you how, let me tell you how. So the title of, uh, uh, of that lecture in May 1974 was Will Capitalism Survive? Question mark, subtitle, and diagnosis, not a prescription. So all I have to do is simply change the word capitalism uh, and replace that with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the URA, uh, something that uh, has been on my mind in the last, uh, uh, in the last several years, really since the beginning of the crisis. And I will explain the connections and, and, and the relations. 
I have to say, uh, uh, going back to his uh, lecture, you know, as, as, as Frank already mentioned, uh, you know, they already saw that liberal development, free from excessive government intervention, was the best practical way to organize uh, our economy and contribute to the well-being of society. Capitalism, as manifested in modern society, and really uh, the, way, the way he was describing it, as implemented in the United States in particular, was an example for other countries to follow. Now, I picked that up after I came to the United States, and, and look, when I go back to Europe, I say, what, you nuts? You picked that up? The American model is going to follow? Yeah, it is. But you need to appreciate uh, why. And that takes, that takes some, some study uh, and, some, and some reflection uh, to get there. I have to also say, you know, the basic thrust of, uh, uh, of, of the lecture uh, here given uh, by 1974 uh, was uh, the challenges associated with the very survival of, of capitalism. This is the Austrian influence. This is uh, his uh, uh, echoing and reinforcing concerns that have been identified by, uh, uh, by Joseph uh, Schumpeter about the survival of capitalism, which is going to be the link uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with my, my focus on the, uh, uh, on the euro area. So reading through, uh, uh, through this uh, lecture, it, it's very brief, uh, maybe uh, I think six, seven pages uh, is, is all it is. One thing that comes out is, uh, is the issue of incentives and people. And this is, this is Ben Rogi Mary economics with political science, you could say sociology, which as an economist I see as part of our profession, but I know that many economists don't agree with that. That's, that's what I see. Uh, ultimately, people and the incentives they have must be compatible with the system to ensure its stability. This is a key insight that, that came out of this, of this work, uh, which can also be restated uh, by, uh, by mentioning that proper governance is key to the survival of the economic system. This is how we can start marrying together uh, how we behave, how we organize our lives, uh, economic factors, political factors, uh, 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 and, and, and so forth. It's important to realize that great plans uh, may not succeed if the incentives they create for people who are meant to operate in those plans undermine the plans in the first place. Uh, and you know, if, if, uh, if you go back to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Schumpeter, uh, whom, uh, whom Ben Rogge cites uh, uh, quite a bit in, uh, in, in this lecture, and Ben Rogge's own analysis, and he, he states very clearly where uh, his views line up exactly with Schumpeter's and where they don't. Uh, it's very clear on this one. So you can identify these uh, this classes of, of individuals that may have uh, uh, conflicting views and approaches. In the capitalist system, we have the entrepreneurs. By the way, those are the guys I teach these days. And uh, uh, then when I came out of business school, I teach future entrepreneurs. And some of them start their business while they're students, which is very difficult for me to comprehend, but I'm just an economist. So that's, that's my weakness. Uh, so you have the business person, and, and the key for capitalism to work is that the entrepreneurs must be given the leeway to create value. And this is what subsequently can be shared by everybody else, the workers, the rest of us, even the economists, if you, if you, uh, if, if, if you wish. Uh, so the problem is that business leaders are, are often an easy target for intellectuals and, and government bureaucrats. These are the two classes that can oppose them. Uh, and this makes the narrative and our understanding of how the economy functions and how wealth is generated uh, very important. Uh, the narrative may not always reflect accurately reality. Recently, I, I've heard people talk about fake news in this country. <coughs> You know, it's not a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. and, and, and trust me, I've, uh, I've seen it work uh, in other countries much more so 
that uh, it has ever been appreciated in the uh, in the United uh, in the United uh, States. It's really important to have an understanding of, of what's going on and have the support. False narratives can actually create a lot of damage and uh, and lead to a collapse of the system that otherwise would have been beneficial to uh, to society. So it's very important for the broader public not to be misled for the capitalist uh, uh, society to work, the public should not be misled into demonizing profit, undermining the very conditions that, uh, that are needed for capitalism to, to flourish, uh, which subsequently uh, allow an economy to, uh, to grow and prosper. I know many people uh, you know, in, in Europe, many more than here, uh, who would find these words heretical. Uh, but this is the struggle that, that Ben already identified in that, uh, in that, in that figure. Um, his conclusion was that uh, uh, capitalism will not survive. Uh, this is the conclusion in his, uh, uh, in his talk. Um, why? Uh, because in his reading, the intellectuals and government bureaucrats will manage to undermine the role of the businessman in, uh, in our society, discouraging entrepreneurship. Without entrepreneurs around, the constant flow of innovation ceases. We don't have anybody generating growth, and the system fails. I go back to his title, the subtitle of his talk. This was Ben Rogers diagnosis. It was not a prescription. And you know, one could have been accused as, uh, as being defeatist, saying this thing which is so wonderful to our collapse. But this was not the point, and he did not see it like that. Um, as a matter of fact, he writes about it uh, you know, in, 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 in his conclusion. He saw the message uh, as a call to war and explain, in his words, to talk and talk and talk. It's important to get the narrative straight in order to inform people not to be misinformed, not to be lulled into, into the false narrative that can destroy something that could be a good thing. So the whole point uh, of, of understanding uh, the sources of why capitalism may fail or will fail is to avoid that, uh, that failure. And this is my starting point with, uh, with really a very similar uh, uh, train of, uh, uh, of thought to a different focus and a different application. So I will talk about the, uh, uh, the Euro area and the European project today uh, in, the, uh, in the following context. Uh, uh, in my view, the, uh, the troubles in Europe that are continuing, they, they started with the global financial crisis and they're continuing even though the situation right now seems to be in remission, if you want to call it that. You, know, you just have some demonstration in Spain, you know, just have some Greece might collapse, uh, you know, Italy might fall under you know, next year, who knows. This is in remission. This is the good uh, <laughs> of, of the crisis in the last, uh, in, in the last uh, 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 10 years. You know, like Brexit, that's fine, it's okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, so, you know, so this is, in, in my view, having seen uh, the functioning of, uh, of the European Union, the Euro area from the inside during part of the crisis, uh, you know, I can only share in the blame of things that happened up to uh, April of 2012. Uh, and it got worse before it got better uh, after, uh, after, uh, after that. So I actually look at that situation as, uh, uh, as one of the uh, uh, greatest global economic challenges uh, today uh, that is still unresolved still uh, from the financial crisis that started now almost 10 years ago. So the issue I will focus on is the survival of the economic and monetary union in Europe, which is the euro area. And by the way, I call this the euro area. This is the, uh, this is the official name uh, of, the, of the entity. Uh, most uh, uh, financial press uh, refers to the same concept as the eurozone. Uh, which is a British invention, not, uh, not corresponding to official Brussels and Frankfurt lingo. So I'm going to stick to the official Brussels and, and Frankfurt lingo 
uh, for my uh, for my uh, for my for my talk. Uh, so, why is this important? One of the reasons is that after the United States, uh, if you look at, at the global economy, the euro area, the, uh, the economic and monetary <coughs> union of right now is 19 states in in Europe, is the largest developed economy in the world. It has some similarities with the United States. Uh, a little bit bigger in terms of population, slightly smaller in terms of, of GDP, uh, free trade uh, throughout the economy, common currency. So we can actually identify with this. And uh, uh, one of the weaknesses I have, uh, having lived uh, most of my life in the United States, uh, I cannot avoid making the constant comparisons and say, you know, this is wrong, this could be done better. We have better examples of this one. Oh, this one works better in Europe. Yeah, I found that. You know, so there are there are these instant comparisons that that, that I make all the uh, all, all the time. So the euro area is is an ongoing uh, experiment, and much like capitalism, which forms the economic basis for this experiment uh, that has been developed in the last in the last few, few decades, it, under some assumptions, it has some fairly uh, solid theoretical basis. We can discuss that, uh, how solid they are. But one thing we, we, are, uh, we can, there's very little disagreement on, is that uh, as a concept, as an idea, it was meant to advance the well-being of society. You say, what can work in practice to improve our lives? Uh, and in theory, it should work. In practice, is where we have questions. Let me, let me start with a little bit of background information, some comparisons with the United States to, uh, to get into, uh, in, into the problem before I, before I go there. Uh, let me first start, that, you know, I'm a European who lived most of my life in this country, but I will take credit for this country, much like many other Europeans would. Because uh, this country, the United States of America, was largely built on ideas brought over from the other side of the Atlantic. So historically, we can actually take, take that view. And, and actually, almost all of that is from states that today constitute the European Union. So that connection is actually very, very close. Uh, it, run, it runs very deep. Uh, let me give you one very, very important example. Here, we'll see later on what, uh, that, uh, that it, uh, it's the, it's the demarcation line of one of the key differences. The Constitution of the United States uh, brought together yeah, since, 19, uh, since 1789, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been in effect, uh, uh, it's really a remarkable achievement in, uh, in governance everywhere in, in human history. But when it was crafted, it's important to understand that it reflected the best elements that have been collected, collected from what we knew about the rest of the world at the time. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it was so in, such incredible lack and much beyond lack that in this country, you had effectively the best constitutional expert of the world at the time. Why? Because they had developed the skill when they were trying to organize the colonies. And then after the War of Independence, the states so they were studying uh, carefully uh, what, what were constitutions around the world. Most of that was from Europe, trying to identify the best elements and, and bring them, uh, and bring them uh, uh, here. This is, how, this is how this country was created with this amazing constitution. Uh, it created a government with the power and responsibility to protect and enhance the well-being of all citizens in the United States. <coughs> I'm not going to get into the definition of citizen. Not for not for my topic. But remember, I you know I have a great heritage, so I can identify uh, with uh, with that definition and the concept of the Athenian democracy and all of that stuff. So we can discuss that some other time. Uh, the key here is that you actually had a constitution that was meant to protect and serve all. And you have sovereign states still, like uh, the state where I live right now, uh, Massachusetts, the state uh, I used to live 10 years ago, Virginia. Sovereign states that actually agreed to bring together 
a federal government that would work in the interest of all at the same time and in parallel with, uh, with the states. So this really was the big achievement in this country that I, I, I can tell you it was really looked at with envy on the other side of the Atlantic. And, you know, Europeans, very proud about our culture, about history. Uh, you know, I don't think many Europeans would admit to this envy of the United States, but it was there. And it became very important after the, uh, the Second World War. Uh, when um, some visionaries in, uh, in Europe saw the success uh, of the United States as the example to follow for a free capitalist society that would lead to prosperity. And this is something that they had some issues in Europe uh, 100 years before uh, the end of the Second World War. It was kind of every decade almost was, uh, was war, peace, war, peace. Uh, and, and this is really why peace and the desire for peaceful coexistence and uh, prosperity was the beginning of the European Union project. Peace. It wasn't really about economics or raising productivity by health percentage points. It's, uh, uh, it's peace. Because the history of Europe, especially uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in the century before, uh, the end of the Second World War it was one of constant uh, uh, cycles of, uh, of destruction. And with the advancements in uh, military technology, uh, by the time we reached the 20th century, that, means, that meant flattening out cities and countries. Uh, uh, I'm going to actually uh, remind you, you don't need this reminder, but I would remind you to, 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 give you, uh, to give you an example of, about how this was described by, by a great German leader. Uh, twice uh, in the 20th century, Europe was destroyed because of a conflict for domination. Um, former German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, you know, if you want to be picky about it, you would say West German Chancellor mm -hmm. before unification. Uh, in, 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 my, uh, uh, in my view, one of the great uh, European leaders of his, uh, of his generations. Uh, he gave a speech in December of 2011, remember the date, December of 2011, to his party by, in, in Berlin, uh, where he, um, he went over the, the historical role of, of Germany in Europe and the constant conflict uh, he saw. Uh, in that speech, uh, among other things, he said, the history, I'm quoting, the history of the continent might well be regarded as a never-ending succession of struggles between the periphery and the center, and vice versa, between the center and the periphery. There's actually a, 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 a rather pessimistic view on, on the future of, of Europe in December of, of, of 2011, when he, when he delivered those, uh, those, those remarks. So again, going back at the end of the Second World War, looking at the United States with envy, um, a number of European visionaries saw an opportunity to start the process of unifying Europe. And yes, part of that could count on US taxpayer money, because uh, the, uh, the US assistance uh, to, uh, uh, to Germany as well as the Allied uh, nations was, was incredibly important for, for jumpstarting the uh, uh, the process. Uh, the goal was to preserve the, uh, the cultural diversity in Europe, but starting from the unification of the economy, reap the benefits of, uh, of, of economies of scale, uh, of, of capitalism uh, in, uh, in its uh, free trade uh, form across borders. Uh, and perhaps eventually, and this was already stated, uh, even during the war, uh, some visionaries uh, uh, were stating and talking about the possibility that this might lead to the uh, United States of Europe. So you have the Germans, the French, the Italians, even the British would live peacefully together, enjoying the prosperity that the capitalist system would uh, uh, promote with free movement of, uh, of capital and labor 
everywhere in the, uh, in, the con in the continent. There was another element to this that actually became more important in, uh, in the more recent decades. In a globalized economy, uh, another part of the vision was to see uh, the unified Europe uh, as the only way Europe could sustain its historical significance in global affairs. Uh, with fast growth in the rest of the world, uh, Asia and uh, uh, projected much more so than actually has happened in, in Africa, individual European states were seen as shrinking in isolation. They would become insignificant. You know, if, we, if, we, if we project 50 years ahead, this is still uh, 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 the reality that, uh, that is being faced. So the economy was to be the engine of the process of unification, and bringing down trade barriers would be recognized as mutually beneficial for all, and the impetus from which greater unification would, uh, would follow. So how do you start a project like this? Actually, it started uh, well. The easiest thing to do is identify something, some, some sector that will almost surely result in mutual benefits for all. And this started in, in 1952 with the European coal and steel community. There are vast economies of scale in steel production. You need coal for steel production. So unifying uh, a, a number of, of states in the continent for uh, coal and steel production with, with free entry, no trade barrier, it was actually the beginning of a chain reaction that led to further and further economic uh, uh, unification in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe. And over time, uh, uh, the, uh, the economic tide became greater. Uh, you know, the, uh, the economic coal and steel community was followed by the European economic community, later on the European community, and in 1992, a big jump, the European Union. The European Union is pretty young. 1992 is, is, when, uh, is when that treaty was, uh, was signed. And gradually, European states were coming closer together and benefited from free trade and closer cooperation in, uh, in, in development. And the process, the project in many ways worked uh, well. It brought to Europe some of the advantages of governance and, and economic affairs that uh, we can identify as, as already being here uh, in, the, in the United, uh, in the United uh, uh, States. However, there was a fateful decision with the creation of the European Union in 1992, which has come back to haunt us. And the decision was that together with an economic union, as complete as possible, Europe could also jump to another characteristic that's very familiar to us uh, uh, in, this, in this country, have a common currency. That's a big step. It was hotly debated at the time. Uh, uh, a lot of people were concerned that uh, not all of the other preconditions for a common currency were being fulfilled. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, uh, in Europe, the UK government uh, uh, negotiated an exception from that requirement uh, and, uh, and, and maintained an option while being part of the European Union to be able not to adopt the common currency uh, unless it decided later on that uh, that would that would be uh, in the uh, in the interest uh, of the uh, of the United uh, Kingdom but most other member states of the union large and small you know Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Ireland, Greece, virtually all of the rest, committed to give up their own currencies and adopt the euro as the common uh, currency. The so European Central Bank was, was set up in 1998 and started operating as of January 1st, uh, 1999, or actually that's the date when the euro became the official currency of the countries that had, uh, that had adopted it. Uh, originally started with 11 member states adopted the currency. They gave away their, uh, their own currencies, they adopted the euro. Today we have 19 uh, out of the uh, 28 member states of the European Union uh, are part of the, uh, of the euro uh, area. Now this was a risky experiment uh, 
but it, the risks, even though they were hotly debated, they were not quite comprehend, comprehended at the, uh, at the time. And this is what I'm going to focus on, because since the global financial crisis is the common currency and what that means, which has created a great risk of unraveling the whole European project. Uh, and this is really the key concern, a step too far that may actually unravel the whole thing uh, if, uh, uh, if we're not careful uh, going forward. You know, so is this something that was understood? How did it happen and why, why are we facing this, uh, this problem that is, that is still with us? I've shared many of the risks. As a matter of fact, surveying in the last few years, I, I go back and survey the literature of you know, who expressed views on, on this. I find that the majority of European economies based in the United States thought that uh, uh, it would not be a good idea for, for member states of the European Union to, to adopt the same currency, that the other conditions were not uh, met. Um, one example very close to me, it's my, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my advisor uh, at MIT, Rudy Dornbusch, a German economist who has made his, uh, his career uh, in the United States, uh, taught mostly at, uh, at MIT, uh, actually uh, took a public position before the, uh, uh, the euro was set in stone. Uh, he wrote, if there was ever a bad idea, ENU it is. ENU standing for the Economic and Monetary Union of the UN. So it's not as if there were not question marks uh, uh, out, uh, uh, out there. But the risks inherent in this experiment were uh, not well understood and uh, in, uh, in the centers of activity in Brussels and when this was created in Frankfurt, they were kind of dismissed. You can actually look at this as, well, this is technocrats, the political decision was taken, this is the project run with it. You can even say that they have much of a choice but, uh, but, but to try to implement this, uh, this, uh, uh, this experiment. The other thing that uh, is interesting to know is that the first several years of the Euro's operations actually look pretty good. From 1999, when the Euro became the common currency, until uh, the beginning of the global financial crisis in 2007, it appeared to work quite well. The flaws only became apparent when the uh, global financial crisis hit. Now, not the turbulences of 2007, as they were being dis described in, uh, in Europe at the time, but the actual crisis uh, that, uh, that started uh, in uh, uh, September, October uh, 2008 uh, in, uh, in New York, of all places. Uh, and, uh, and you may consider this ironic, but uh, this was a problem that was overcome in the United States and is still with us in Europe from, uh, from, back, uh, from back then. Because the, the crisis is what really made crystal clear what the flaws in the original design of the, uh, of the euro was. And this is what I will try to explain in some general terms and then give you some, some, some specific examples about the risks. And the starting point is the following. Think about any crisis, <coughs> country facing a crisis, household facing a crisis. What do we mean when we talk about a crisis? Virtually all the times, when I'm talking about economic affairs, um, with a crisis we are describing a situation where expectations about the level of, of, of income and level of consumption that we thought was there in a household, in a corporation, in a country, uh, uh, turn out to be false. And we have to adjust expectations downward. And we say, well, this country actually is not as rich as we thought it was. So, you know, on average, uh, the people in this country will have to adjust their consumption downwards a couple percentage points. Same thing with the household, same thing with the business, if you can survive uh, a crisis. So you have the disappointment having to do with recognizing that a crisis means losses. Now, we're talking about a crisis for a country we have to visualize both economic losses. This means that the country is poorer 
the United States, as of the end of 2008, we could safely say was poorer than a year earlier. can say that. But we're talking about a country in crisis. We're trying to realize that there are political losses that have to be incurred. Someone is going to have to manage this crisis. And there are going to be tough decisions, unpopular decisions. There will be political losses and economic losses. So think about how we deal with economic losses and political losses. Let's focus on the economic losses. What's the key question? Well, who's going to pay? When we have the losses crystallized, who will pick up the tab? That becomes uh, a key question. And, you know, this is something I picked up uh, in my, in my uh, training from my Federal Reserve days, uh, before I had to deal with, with the mess in, uh, in Europe. Proper crisis management is all about minimizing the total cost. Once you realize that you're in crisis, you want to minimize the total cost for, for your economy, for your society. That's one aspect. And there is a second aspect that's trickier and almost entirely political. And this is the distribution of those costs among different stakeholders and population. I mean, successful crisis management would both, number one, minimize the total cost, and number two, manage a fair distribution of the costs among the stakeholders. Now that's hard to do. It's not a trivial matter. If you think about the United States after the, uh, after the Lehman collapse, you would have officials in the administration, the Fed, uh, the Congress, working together to try to minimize the carnage that was, that was, that was all around. <coughs> Tirelessly working, trying to take decisions that would be controversial, it would be politically sensitive, and they would take some political heat and, and, and the criticism. Uh, you know, I, I, have to, I have to be clear. When this was happening, a rerun of the terrible outcomes of the Great Depression for the United States could not have been ruled out. We actually needed to have good crisis management to avoid the terrible outcomes we had in the Great Depression uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this country. And this was avoided in this country. So yeah, the crisis was, was very bad, but the worst outcomes were uh, uh, avoided. Uh, in Europe, however, it's played out very differently. So if you look at, at the data in the Euro area, what you're going to see is that the initial reaction to the crisis was very similar. So you have a drop in aggregate demand, very similar to a drop in the United States. You had a fiscal and monetary policy response, very similar to that in the United States. You had uh, the, uh, the, the beginning of a recovery in 2009, very similar to the United States, and then something happened. As of, to, as of the end of 2009, like a year after, after the Lehman collapse, uh, the euro area got into something that looked more or less like a sustained recession and paralysis that uh, uh, policymakers, governments uh, in, uh, in, in the euro area were not able to, uh, to manage uh, very well. To give you an idea of the magnitudes, since then, per capita GDP in the euro area has been about 10 percentage points lower than what it would have been if the euro area had grown out of the global financial crisis uh, on the same pace uh, as, the, uh, as, uh, as the United States. Now, 10 percentage points a year, it adds up. Now, 10 years, you're talking about a year worth of GDP. This is, these are not small, small numbers. So how did the uh, common currency specifically lead to this, to this disaster, because this is something that is very specific to the euro area. If you actually, if you actually compare uh, the, uh, the recovery from the global financial crisis of uh, member states of the European Union that are not in the euro area, they have done much better. The problem is within the euro area. There is something about the functioning or malfunctioning of the currency that, that led to this. And this is what leads me back to, to the original starting point. In one word, the problem is governance. And more precisely, the lack of effective common governance in the European construction, especially in the, in the euro area. So what we have with this experiment is that adopting the euro as the common currency 
tied together the fates of, uh, of those member states in the European Union that, that decided to give away their, uh, their, their own currency, they gave away uh, their, their monetary sovereignty, and they all depended on a common currency governed by uh, a common uh, institution, the European Central Bank, that was set up in Frankfurt, that in theory was meant to represent the euro area as a whole, but practice is not always the same as theory. And you have some tensions that are, that are being created as a, uh, uh, as a result. Now, if you have a crisis and you have a common institution responsible for crisis management, but you have different member states, different governments with a stake in this, it's really critical to have very close cooperation of the different member states. Well, that wasn't available for the simple reason that uh, the European Union and, uh, uh, as a result, the euro area didn't have a common government. They only had a common central bank. And other than that, there wasn't really anybody who had the responsibility to do the crisis management you would have seen in Washington DC in, uh, in this country. Now, is this something that was kind of missed, uh, misunderstood? Actually, it was there by design. It's one of the flaws in the design of the system that uh, in 1992, when, uh, when European governments decided to go ahead and jump into this construction, they could not agree with each other on how to set up a crisis management framework. So they decided, oh, that's OK. We can actually go ahead without one in hopes that either, number one, a crisis will not occur, or number two, when a crisis does occur, which everybody knew one would occur, then all of the governments that signed up the European Union Treaty would come together, sing Kumbaya together, and solve the problem together during the crisis. This was the concept, and this was the basis uh, that, that created uh, uh, the euro. And unfortunately, uh, this belief or hope, whichever way you want to describe it, uh, proved uh, misplaced. Uh, uh, so ultimately, the issue is that uh, the European construction, and, and the euro area I was describing before, that has all of these nice similarities with the United States, is not a federal state. It's just a collection. It's a loose collection. Of, uh, uh, of, of sovereign states, it's a loose confederation, without anybody who can force cooperation when it really matters. When things are going well, piece of cake, no problem. Mm -hmm. If you are in the worst crisis uh, that, that, that the global economy has experienced in what was 80 years, that can become a, a tricky. So this was, this was an issue. Uh, in that without a federal government, with the European Union is governed by a treaty, the Maastricht Treaty that has been signed in 1992, uh, whenever a decision had to be made, look, in the United States, you would have uh, people from the Fed, literally, they could walk to the Treasury, and if they wanted to, they could walk to Congress and within an afternoon figure out what to do to fix a problem. Um, in the context of the European Union, of the Euro area, they actually needed to reach unanimous agreement among the democratically elected governments of the Euro area to fix even minor things that were not foreseen in the treaty. But when you're governed by treaty and something is not in the treaty, you need unanimous agreement to, uh, to have a modification. Or you need to come up with a new treaty that requires the United agreement of, of, all of, the, of all of the members. And in this environment, not all member states are equal. And that's where you start seeing, uh, seeing more, uh, more, more trouble. Some large states, such as Germany and France, being the, the first and, and uh, largest and second largest uh, state uh, in, uh, in the European Union, have much greater influence than other smaller states. And this actually is what has come back to haunt us with Brexit that we can discuss later on as, as, as one of the consequences of the mishandling of, of what went on with the, with, with the Euro crisis. So what you have in this environment is, again, the crisis means losses, 
someone needs to crystallize the losses. You have leaders in member states. What's their job? Is their job to minimize the losses for the euro as a whole? No. Each leader of each member state in a democracy is responsible to his or her own constituency. So what, what happened during the crisis is that exactly at the worst moment uh, that, that could be faced, uh, we had decisions by a handful of individuals, each one of them trying to protect the interests of their own countries, their own constituents, and nobody really caring for the whole. And this is what ended up creating this, this huge problem of, of winners and losers uh, in, uh, in, in Europe with vast distributional consequences uh, and significant costs. It's actually quite important to, to talk about specific individuals at the time. You can go country by country and see who was the leader, what was their thinking, what, what, they, were, uh, what they were doing. Well, 2008, this is an important detail, was sufficiently removed from the Second World War <coughs> that many of the leaders who were governing uh, European member states at the time really had lost track of the original purpose of the European project. Peace? We have peace. We've had peace for two generations. That's a given. Now let's see how much we can, we can grab from the other member states and maximize our economic well-being. So the mentality actually had changed by the time we got to the crisis, if you look at the generation of leaders, um, France, uh, you know, who, was, who, was the, who was the leader in France at the time, President Sarkozy, he faced uh, uh, political vulnerabilities. France was not uh, as strong uh, in 2008 as it had been a decade earlier in its relative position in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, you know, President Sarkozy eventually uh, could not handle the situation and uh, he lost power. Look at, look at Germany. We had, a, we had a generational shift in the 2000s in the leadership of, uh, of Germany. Uh, in 2008, uh, the leader was Chancellor uh, Merkel. Uh, a little bit about her background, an East German and former communist, who interestingly, by the time uh, of the crisis, had developed uh, a well-earned reputation as a ruthless political survivor, masterful in taking decisions that would bring about short-term political benefits for her career without really paying attention to anything else. You know, this is, uh, I'm gonna cite here uh, the, uh, the late German sociologist Ulrich Beck. Uh, during the crisis coined the term Merkavelli to uh, describe uh, the, the chancellor's modus operandi and actually analyze uh, the risks associated with, uh, with, with that modus operandi for Germany and for Europe. You know, and, and if, if you go read, uh, he has a, uh, uh, Ulrich Beck has his uh, short uh, book. It has been translated in, in English. Unfortunately, I don't read German, so I could not read the original. And he talks about Machiavelli, uh, who had explained how impeding catastrophes create opportunities that can be seized by an individual with a talent for power, one of it was. Uh, and for Chancellor Merkel, as Beck explains in his, uh, in his book, you know, there example after example after example in her political career, and that was the leader of Germany during, during the crisis. So I have an issue here that if you are dealing with a crisis like that, you can actually do pretty well in your country. But in doing so, uh, the chancellor's approach uh, developed a very divisive narrative of the crisis in, in Europe that actually fueled nationalism, first in Germany and then in other other countries in Europe. You know, so the, what we see uh, in the last few years is not accidental. Actually, this goes back and back and back. And quite a bit of it you can identify with with a crisis response where you have the economic downturn uh, in combination with, with these other factors uh, creates uh, create these, these challenges. So in this, in this framework, the loose, the loose confederation structure with asymmetric leverage in, in European affairs and some, uh, some member state being led by fantastic leaders for benefiting their country 
this whole thing disintegrated into a game uh, during the crisis of shifting losses to others. So whenever something was coming up, we are facing a crisis, who's gonna, who's gonna eat the loss? Are we gonna share it? The answer was no. Why don't we shift it to those guys? Why don't we shift it to those guys? Think about it in the context of the United States. If uh, the Federal Reserve in late 2008 was taking decisions guided by, hmm, how do we bail out the financial system so that, uh, let's say, Texas is spared from any losses and possibly if possible making gains, and we shift all of the losses to Indiana? It is the sort of mentality you could you could have it in parallel to uh, uh, to it. Of course, this wasn't happening in the United States. This would be unthinkable uh, in the United States. Unfortunately, in in Europe, without a government, that was the mode of operation. You actually had the leaders of each country, each protecting their own interests and using their leverage to that end. So. Uh, we have examples of this, uh, uh, of, of this, uh, of, of these things, and, and the statistics show the results of, uh, of this mismanagement. Remember, I mentioned before, per capita GDP in the euro area, on average, has been, in the last seven eight years, ten percentage points lower than it would have been if the euro area recovered like the United States. In fact, I use the U.S. as my benchmark for this one. That's fine. But this actually is hiding a very, very important distinction. If you take each member state in the euro area in isolation, that's not what you see. If you take Germany, for example, what you're going to see is that German per capita GDP has done much better than that of the United States. Well, what does that mean? Just do the arithmetic. Yes, Chancellor Merkel has masterfully gained the system to make sure that Germany did even better than the US in a situation where the euro area overall was doing very badly. Germany is about 30% of the euro area. This means that, that everybody else did so much worse. So everybody else not only did 10 percentage points worse than the United States, they did much worse than that on average. You have some examples. You know, everybody knows about, about Greece, a drop of 25% of, of GDP per person. This is like great depression. Great Depression proportions. You know, as a microeconomist, that's the sort of experience I thought we had learned how to fix. Apparently not, when politics interferes. Uh, but you know, you have bigger countries that are uh, problematic. Uh, take Italy. Italy is the third largest uh, member state uh, in the in the euro area. Just to give you a statistic that summarizes. Uh, the tensions you uh, you see in Italy and, uh, uh, and and what may be an important factor in, in the elections they are like they are scheduled to have next year uh, per capita GDP in Italy today is lower lower the level is lower than what it was in 1999 when Italy joined the euro. And so the, the loss they've experienced since the beginning of the financial crisis. And then the continuous, pretty much continuous recession has kept them down all the time. That's the mirror image of, uh, of the success uh, Chancellor Merkel has engineered uh, for Germany. And, and this, of course, is what has created these immense tensions that you see, uh, uh, you see this, uh, these days in, uh, uh, in Europe. So you can ask yourself, why was currency the issue? You know, why is this something that we see in the euro area, the common currency that we didn't see in, in other member states of the European Union that were not part of the, uh, of the euro? There are a number of reasons. I will give you one economic reason that's, that, that's clear cut. We just were not sure how, how costly this would be. Exchange rate flexibility is a very important uh, uh, buffer when, when you have asymmetric shocks uh, in, uh, in an economy. Without the euro, given what had been happening, say, in Germany and Italy in the last few years, the German currency would have appreciated relative to the Italian currency, and that would have actually smoothed out the imbalances both in Germany and in Italy. So that cannot be done when you have a common currency. You have to have other mechanisms that mirror that, but the other mechanisms require the United States of the euro. So they don't happen. Now, that's one element. But there is another reason, which is that the control of 
currency creates opportunities for economic exploitation. And I would say possibly inadvertent loss shifting during the crisis. Controlling the currency is very powerful. And uh, you know, those of you who attended uh, uh, the, uh, the talk I gave during lunch, I've given you some examples about just how much you can do if you can control the crisis. Now, in a financial crisis, the central bank of a country has tremendous power to avert collapses. Central bank can stop panics by serving as a market maker of last resort, as a lender of last resort. We've seen the Fed do this in spades in this country. Okay, that's clear cut. Central bank can protect the financial sector, can protect governments from unnecessary stress. We've seen that happen in this country. But one of the issues is that central bank decisions along these lines have fiscal implications, and those fiscal <coughs> implications can be very controversial, and they can be criticized by governments. And in the case of Europe, the ECB has actually been sued multiple times for some of the decisions that it had been taken during, during the crisis. Uh, in a monetary union without a common government, when you have uh, a common central bank taking decisions that can have distribution consequences, this is just plainly inviting trouble. And the ACB is in the middle of this trouble uh, in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, few years. Now on top of that, just conceptually think of the following hypothetical scenario. Suppose that a large member state manages to exert disproportionately large influence of the central bank that is common to all. Then, uh, among other things, you can influence whether there would be proper crisis management uh, in, in some smaller country or not. Uh, you have a situation where a small country may have a small problem that would have been easily fixed if it controlled its own currency, but if it's part of the euro area, it actually has to rely on the collection of all of the other member states and the wisdom of the governing council of the ACB on whether the obvious fix would be done or not. That doesn't happen if you, uh, if you, are, uh, uh, if you have your own currency. And, and there have been, uh, unfortunately, a number of quite troubling uh, decisions uh, by the ACB. Uh, you can actually go have a look at a recent uh, independent report by uh, Transparency International uh, uh, that has raised numerous uncomfortable questions about uh, uh, ECB practices during the crisis. Not that I would know any of them or had seen any of them, but uh, <laughs> just reading the report. Uh. If you give an example, uh, consider Ireland and the UK. Yeah. Two countries, islands, similar legal system. They kind of almost speak the same language with different accents. Uh, similar capitalist societies, and they faced very similar problems before the global financial crisis. Both of these countries, like the United States, had a real estate boom and a bloated banking system. They had a, uh, a real estate uh, collapse and related banking problems. Both of them in the European Union. But they could not actually handle their problems in the same way. Why? Because Ireland had also enjoyed the euro area. So it did not have control of its own fate. It actually had to rely on the ECB for the crisis management that it would do. So if you actually follow what happened in the UK and Ireland and during the crisis, you're going to see in the UK the government took some very controversial decisions, bailed out some banks with the knowledge that the Bank of England was there to do proper central banking and help the country, you know, without, within the legal context that's common in the, in the EU, in the security that they were doing. It actually came out of the, of the global financial crisis uh, quite well, I would say. You know, everybody is disappointed with growth being low, even in the United States. We are disappointed with growth being low. But in terms of actually managing the crisis, 
they, they come out of, uh, uh, I'd say, relatively well. If you compare this with Ireland, it's different. I'll give you one example that is, that is widely known to public. In 2010, the Irish government thought that it would be best for Ireland if it uh, let uh, one bank fail. What was the problem with that bank? Well, it had, uh, it had exposure to real estate, lost value, so the, the, the bank didn't really have any capital. Well, that bank had issued massive quantities of uh, private debt. And one of the problems was that that debt was held in part by institutions in other countries. German banks and insurance companies were holding a lot of Irish private bank debt. So what do you do in that situation? If you're the Irish government, the Irish government says, well, you know, this is, this is what's best for Ireland. We need to, to let that debt go. We are not uh, 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 dishonoring any of our responsibility with public debt. We will fully honor public debt. This is private debt. You know, they bought it. They should bear the cost. Um, except uh, that would have created a problem. Had they done that, then German banks and insurance companies would have incurred uh, significant losses. <coughs> Enter the ACB with a uh, sequence of messages to the government uh, uh, in late 2010. Messages is a, is a key word. It could be verbal, it could be written, who knows what it is. Uh, later on, it became public that it was actually letters, it was written, yeah, the messages. So uh, the consideration was communicated to the Irish government that the ECB might consider cutting off liquidity to Ireland, thus leading to the full collapse of the Irish financial system. And the Irish government got the message. They decided on their own, completely voluntarily, <laughs> to fully honor the private debt that had been issued by uh, a failing bank. And in this way, uh, German banks and insurance companies that, that held that debt were fully, fully repaid. Who picked up the tab? The Irish taxpayer. This is just an example. And this is an example of those that are, that are fully in public you. Again, I'm not going to mention any of the examples that are not fully in public uh, uh, view. Uh, uh, but we have, we have examples like, like this. I'll really show you how the game was being played. And you, you have to admire in this game being played that more than any other government, the German government succeeded under the leadership of Chancellor Merkel to protect the interest of its constituents at the cost of other member states. And, and the Chancellor has been rewarded for this uh, success. If you actually look at all of the leaders of European uh, Euro area member states in, in 2008, they're all gone, except one. Because the voters rationally reward the leader who actually benefited them at the expense of, uh, of, other, of other countries. But this is, this is what has created this unfortunate side effect. It has generated winners and losers in Europe, it has, it, and it has generated a level of resentment that had not been seen there since the beginning of the European project and until, and, and, uh, until the crisis uh, uh, hit. These are the divisions we have right now uh, related to the mishandling of the, uh, of the Euro area project that still threaten uh, the uh, 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 Europe. So, so I can summarize by saying that incomplete governance is what made the, uh, the, euro, the euro area vulnerable to these, to these shocks. Adopting a common currency without stronger political institutions, it proved to be far more dangerous, a step too far, if you wish, relative to the slow progress that was being done uh, in Europe to, uh, to advance the European uh, uh, project. Uh, this additional step made survival of the project too sensitive to specific individuals who happened to be in charge during the crisis. If you are talking about specific individuals, you are talking about to what extent these individual leaders valued protecting uh, the European project against the potential cost of their own future political career. That's a tough trade-off. And you know, there are 
great politicians who care about the social good much more than their own personal career, but not all politicians are equal in this, in this regard. And this is not something that, that was wise to leave it to chance and then see you know, who's gonna be there. Maybe they're gonna work together nicely, maybe, uh, uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, not here that, you know, it's just, this is not meant to criticize any specific choice or any specific individual. This is all about the incentives, the narrative that is created and how it's being used. It's all about the, the organizational structure of the construction. You did not set it up correctly, it created these incentives that unfortunately made the system vulnerable. And here's how we, here's how we ended up where we, we are uh, uh, today. Uh, it's interesting to know, and, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, in closing, I want, to, I want to highlight this element. This is not something that came out of nowhere. Uh, the problem was actually recognized as it was unfolding. Uh, including by uh, uh, by uh, by some German states statesmen, uh, I'm going to return uh, and, uh, and give you an example again from former Chancellor uh, Helmut Schmidt, because he had identified in real time the corrosive nature of the role of Germany in Europe very accurately, and he made public interventions as the crisis was was unfolding. Uh, which was before, before he passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Now, remember that Helmut Schmidt was one of the founding fathers of the European project, so he knew the weaknesses. Uh, he knew the, the loopholes, if you wish, the weak spots uh, in the governance of, uh, uh, of, the, of the European project that could be exploited. And this made the difference. In, in, uh, in the narrative, and, and he challenged the narrative that was, that was proposed by the German government at the time. So if you compare his, uh, uh, his talk at, at, at the time, whereas uh, the chancellor posed the crisis as a problem with moral connotations. If you go back, you're gonna see this in the press all over the place, in 2010, 2011, it was all about the fiscal profligacy of, uh, of the European periphery, the lazy people in the Mediterranean, uh, in contrast with the hard-working people in the core of Europe who were very careful and frugal. And this is how the German Chancellor uh, decided to present uh, the crisis. Uh, in contrast, Helmut Schmidt, at the same time, saw that Europe's inability to tackle the crisis fundamentally reflected a failure in political leadership. That was a remarkable speech he gave in October of 2011, a couple of months before the very pessimistic speech he had given in December of 2011, when he was talking about wars and, and how badly Europe had gone. And, and what he said in, in October of 2011, this was a speech uh, in Frankfurt and on the front row, uh, uh, he was facing the German Chancellor. Uh, and he stressed, quote, what we have in fact uh, is a crisis of the ability of the European Union's political bodies to act, his emphasis. This glaring weakness of action is a much greater threat to the future of Europe than the excessive debt levels of European, of individual Euro area uh, uh, countries. And in, in his views, actually the problems went back to the construction of the Euro, the Maastricht Treaty that set up the currency, and he went on to say, Quote, but there was a failure to set down the economic and legal rules of the game for the currency. The same rules whose non-existence led to their exploitation later on by, by others. As he was saying, a powerful authority with responsibility for fiscal and economic policy was not set up subsequently either. That was lacking and you could not do proper crisis management. And there was also, he continued, a failure to assign the necessary legal status to the Stability and Growth Pact, which had been agreed by all, which, he reminded everybody, Germany and France violated long before Greece did. But the rules of the game kept shifting during the crisis, depending on who could win and who would lose. And unfortunately, this was a former German chancellor trying to convince the then German Chancellor 
Now that could not change either the political reality nor the course of events during, during the crisis. So where do we stand today? Well, I'm going to summarize by, by noting that the exploitation of the, of the euro and shifting losses from constituents in some member states to others, it has not even been addressed in Brussels and in Frankfurt. And of course, not correct. We are very far away even from acknowledging uh, the, uh, the problem. Uh, existing European institutions, unfortunately, have proven too weak and prone to manipulation by influential member states to protect the common interest of the euro area. Uh, and this is the key difference with the United States. Absent a common government with the authority to serve the interests of all, the, the European project continues to be vulnerable to forces of disintegration. This is why I conclude that under its current governance structure, uh, the euro area will not survive. Uh, but I end by going back to, uh, uh, to Ben Reuters' example. This is my diagnosis. This is not a prescription. It's meant to warn and explain. For Ben Reuters' example, the aim is to talk and talk and talk. The goal is to explain the challenge, correct the narrative, just hoping that the adverse outcome will be averted. And 